Hi everyone, I'm Olga and uh, I'm an assistant professor of uh, operations research at Erasmus University Rotterdam and my main research topic is conic optimization. In particular, I'm interested in polynomial optimization and today I'll give you a short introduction into this topic and uh, present two examples of using this topic in data analysis. I'm very glad to talk here at DataFest and thanks a lot to Irina and uh, Max for inviting me. And just before we begin, I'd like to clarify that there is no mistake in the description of my profile on the website. I have changed my affiliation recently before I worked at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. Now I work in Rotterdam. That's it about the intro. Now let's go to the real stuff. We will begin by introducing the most general form of a polynomial, polynomial optimization problem. So we will deal with n variant polynomials of degree d. That is a polynomial p of x, where x is from x1 to xn. And here is an example of a bivariate polynomial of degree 2. Assume that we are given polynomials p and g1 to gm. We introduced the set s which is the set of all x's for which g1 to gm are non-negative. And our problem is to minimize p on this set s. It looks very simple, but it is not as simple as it looks like, because this problem is very general and a lot of real-life problems can be cast in this framework, which hints already that it must be hard. And it is indeed very hard, and there, is, there are many ways to deal with it, here in this presentation we will consider one way which is one of the oldest ones and i think is one of the most intuitive to begin with so what we will do we will first rewrite our problem as a lower bounding problem that is we want to find a lower bound lambda such that of course first it is a lower bound so p of x minus lambda is non-negative on s and such that this lower bound is the best lower bound for p on s because the best lower bound for p on s will be exactly the minimum of p on s so these two problems are equivalent however we have rewritten one problem is very gen which is very general as another problem which is more particular in the sense that we have a more precise question here we have a question when is some polynomial for example, p of x minus lambda, non-negative on some set, for example, x. So if we focus on these kind of questions, and if we are able to answer these kind of questions, then we are able to solve these kind of problems. Of course, since these two problems are equivalent, this question must be hard, and it is hard. And to deal with this question, we will use a particular trick, which will be the main uh, trick of this presentation. And to introduce it, uh, first, we will consider a simplified case. So instead of considering a general S, we will consider Rn first. So we don't have any additional constraints, just X and Rn. And now we replace here the constraint that P minus lambda is non negative on Rn by the following constraint. We say that P minus lambda is equal to a sum of squares of some polynomials. Clearly, by definition, a sum of squares is always non-negative on Rn. Therefore, p minus lambda is non-negative on Rn. And this whole expression is still a lower bound for p on Rn. However, we don't know if these two expressions are equivalent. So we will look at this question if this is equivalent next. And so far, we will look at the following. At first glance, it seems like uh, we have just written one hard problem by, in some way, uh, which looks like another hard problem. However, this is actually not the case. These problems are essentially different. So while verifying that some polynomial is not negative, is hardly possible. It is uh, not clear how to tackle that. 
verifying that some polynomial is a sum of squares is possible and even possible in polynomial time. So it means that by uh, uh, we maybe sacrifice the quality of the bound because we don't know if that's equivalent, but we obtain a bound which is really uh, solvable. So we obtain a problem which is really solvable. And next I will show actually why these problems are different and how to solve such a problem. So we had our uh, initial lower bound problem, we have our simplified lower bound problem, which is now uh, a relaxation of the initial one. And we say that P minus lambda is equal to some sigma, where sigma is an SOS. To obtain a tractable problem, a solvable problem, uh, we want to restrict the degree of this SOS and we restricted it to two capital D. Now that we do it, we know that this problem is equivalent to another problem. <clears throat> In this another problem, <clears throat> sorry, we still search for a bound lambda and for a matrix M. And this problem is <clears throat> linear in lambda and m. And the only constraint which actually makes it hard or non-trivial is this constraint. This constraint means that the matrix m is positive semi-definite. Any problem uh, which is linear in optimization variable and has this kind of constraints is called a semi-definite program. And these programs are polynomial time solvable to any arbitrary precision. So as long as you can write something in this form, it means you can solve it, for example, using some state of the art solvers, or you can use your own algorithm, which can be based on the interior point method, for example. Now, as a reminder, a matrix is positive semi-definite if its quadratic form is always non-negative. Here, you can see that P minus lambda is equal to a quadratic form of a positive semi-definite matrix, which means that P minus lambda is always non-negative. So this formulation is definitely a lower bound on the original problem. The interesting result here is that these two bounds are exactly the same, which means that every sum of squares polynomial can be written as a quadratic form of some positive semi-definite matrix. And this vector in this quadratic form is nothing but the vector of monomials up to degree d, so that the whole SOS is of degree 2d. And uh, here I provide uh, an example of a vector of monomials for a bivariate x and d equal to 2. So a vector of monomials is just all possible products of all variables up to degree d. Now we have this problem, and now we know that this problem is polynomial time solvable, and uh, we can always implement it and solve it when we need. So we have reduced our very hard problem, this one, the first one, to something way easier. And the question is, how much did we lose in quality, or didn't we lose much? So next we'll look at this question. And this question is a long-standing question because it seems very intuitive that a non-negative polynomial should be writable in a form of sum, sum of squares. The question is a sum of squares of what? And uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, Artin has shown that any non-negative polynomial can be written as a sum of squares, but not just of polynomials, but of ratios of polynomials. This is a more complicated expression than just polynomials. And this theorem actually implies that there exist polynomials which cannot be written as an SOS. So our bound, which we have just obtained, is actually a weaker bound. It will not provide us a perfect lower bound. The next question is how non-perfect it is. Do we lose much? First, there exists no negative polynomials, which are not SOS. And it is not such a rare case. There is a lot of them. 
the first such polynomial discovered uh, is called a Moskin polynomial. And uh, this is a very simple polynomial, just two variables and degree six. And this polynomial is non-negative uh, by the arithmetic geometric mean inequality. So this term is uh, an arithmetic mean of these three elements and this term is their geometric mean. So this is always larger than this. So the polynomial is always non-negative. However, by looking at the degrees of the terms in uh, the Moskin polynomial, one can conclude that these degrees can never pop up in this way in uh, a sum of squares. So this is not a sum of squares, but it can be written as a sum of ratios of squares. It actually requires four ratios to write it, so not so simple. Now, Arjun's theorem provides us a perfect answer for how to reformulate our problem of minimizing p of x on Rn. However, to use this answer, we would have to use these type of expressions. And in these type of expressions, as we discussed before, we know how to rewrite the numerator using semi-definite matrices. We know how to rewrite the denominator using semi-definite matrices. But this whole thing is nonlinear in semi-definite matrices. And this is not something that we can easily deal with. So usually Artin's theorem is not used for practical purposes, unfortunately. And for practical purposes, we still reduce ourselves to the sum of squares. However, a good news is that uh, this reduction, although not perfect, as we have seen, is still not too bad. First, there are several cases uh, for which actually non-negative polynomials are SOS polynomials. So as long as we have a non-negative polynomial of one of these three types, we know it can be written as a sum of squares, which means that we can safely optimize our sums of squares and we will obtain very good bounds. For other polynomials, things are not so easy. However, uh, it has been shown that uh, by replacing here by considering here sums of squares of higher and higher and higher degrees, we will actually be obtaining better and better and better bounds. So at some point we will actually get a sequence of bounds which can be pretty informative about our real bound. So that is all about the simplest case where our set is equal to Rn. But we started with a set S, which is a set defined by polynomial inequalities. And now we need to see what happens when we deal with this kind of sets. And with this kind of sets, we actually just generalize this result with SOS. So we again use sums of squares, but in a little bit different way. So instead of just using one sum of squares, sigma zero, we use also an additional term, which is a summation of some sums of squares, sigma i, multiplied by gi. Therefore, as long as gi's are non-negative, this summation is non-negative and the whole expression is non-negative. Hence, a polynomial of this form is always non-negative, and we can safely use it in uh, the same way as we did for Rn. Namely, we can replace our upper bounding problem by a relaxation, where we will search for lambda and sigma zero to sigma m, such that p minus lambda has this expression and the sigmas are sums of squares. And of course, we have to restrict the degree. However, and in this case, again, we have pretty nice results. So first from this theorem, it follows that as long when our set is compact and has additional property, which is not very restrictive, uh, we have a chance actually to get an optimal solution by doing this procedure and increasing D. Second, in any case, we obtain some uh, sequence of uh, lower bounds by increasing D. So this sequence of lower bounds has been investigated and studied by Jean Lasserre and therefore, this approach of using this result by putting R in optimization and obtaining a sequence of bounds by increasing this capital D is called Lasser's hierarchy. And Lasser's hierarchy, I think, is 
the most frequently used approach in polynomial optimization, and it provides very strong bounds. Now, sorry, I have moved in the wrong direction. Now, basically, we're almost done with the theory. And let's sum up uh, what we have uh, just seen. So first, we can rewrite any polynomial optimization problem using the lower bound approach. And in this lower bound approach, we can replace the non-negativity constraint by a sum of squares constraint. And dealing with sum of squares is equivalent to dealing with um, SDP matrices. And this is possible and there exist uh, tools to do that. Also, as a result, we obtain good lower bounds. Those lower bounds frequently converge to the optimal value. And also, there are ways to extract solutions from this problem. So this is just perfect. The drawback of uh, this approach is actually the SDP. If you remember, maybe the SDP is of the size that is equal to this, the number of monomials in, uh, of degree D. This number of monomials is equal to uh, D plus N choose N. So it actually increases exponentially in both N and D. Therefore, as long as we have roughly speaking any real life problems, we very quickly go out of the scope of um, the existing state-of-the-art SDP solvers. So until recently, polynomial optimization has mostly been a tool for theoretical analysis. However, things are not so bad in the sense that there are many tricks to deal with these SDPs when they become large. Especially, uh, there are many ways to go on if uh, our problem is sparse or symmetric. And uh, therefore, recently, I'd say there have been quite many new, new applications of polynomial optimization emerging. And uh, next, I'll talk about two of these applications, which seem to have certain sparsity in them. So potentially in the future, they actually can uh, be implemented in, implementable in the real life. And uh, as to myself, I mostly do theoretical polynomial optimization. But the applications with uh, which sometimes I deal are applications in energy systems optimization. Energy system optimization, systems optimization is uh, one of the strongest uh, applications of polynomial optimization because these problems are very sparse and to obtain optimal solutions or very good bounds for these problems, it is actually enough to consider d equal to 1 or d equal to 2, which is very good for the Lasser hierarchy. It means that the problems are in general not too large. However, for this talk, I wanted to present some problems which are related to the topic of interest of the audience here to uh, data science. So I have found uh, a couple of uh, data science related paper, papers on data analysis, which use polynomial optimization. Uh, and uh, I found them quite amusing and I hope you will like them too. So let's proceed. The first paper will be just an immediate uh, consequence of what it, we have just discussed, namely that non-negative polynomials or functions in this case can be well approximated by sums of squares of polynomials. It is quite frequent in uh, data science, even I am aware of it, that uh, people would like to solve the following problem. They want to find a function from some family F and such that this function minimizes some convex functional and some penalty term. And uh, the first example which popped up in my mind was uh, the elastic net regression, where the family F will be the family of uh, functions which are linear in both features uh, and parameters. 
uh, L would be the least squares operator and omega would be the sum of norm 1 and norm 2. This regression actually possesses quite a lot of freedom because this fact that the function can be linear in features and you can construct from these data points a lot of features and parameters is very good for optimization purposes. But it is not always uh, possible to use this kind of linear families f in this problem. So, for example, another popular um, task which people have to do is to estimate density. And density is always non-negative. So I cannot use a linear function uh, to estimate a density because a function, linear function, which is always non-negative, will be just zero. So we have to do something else. And I know that there are quite some ways. For example, one can use kernels, which are always non-negative. However, each way has its restrictions. So it's always good to have more ways. And basically, I have found uh, a manuscript which uh, suggests an estimator based on sums of squares, uh, which is similar in its properties to this estimator that is linear in features and parameters, which means that it's a very non-restrictive estimator in at least in theoretical sense. Uh, and I'm going to share it with you. So here is the reference to the manuscript. There will be a list of references uh, at the end of this presentation. The manuscript is very recent, so all manuscripts I have considered are very recent. Uh, but uh, I think they have a good potential and they're available on archive. So again, we have this problem where F belongs to some family and we know that F has to be non-negative. Now we recalled this idea, we can recall this idea that uh, some non-negative function can be written as an SOS and an SOS means some vector of monomials multiplied by an SDP matrix again multiplied by the vector of monomials as we have seen before and d here is the degree now we can generalize this idea and we can replace the vector of monomials by the vector of features and then we obtain something kind of similar to the estimator linear in both parameters and features in this first part however it also has this second part so it is again multiplied by the features so this estimator is quadratic in features, but still linear in parameters. And this is actually nice because first it preserves convexity in L and second, it admits a representative theorem, which basically means that the optimal function F here can be written using some basis functions and independently of uh, how many entries we have here in the vector of features, the basis functions will involve SDP matrices of the size m by m, by m uh, where m is the number of observations. These matrices can be, of course, still huge. So the authors here, they suggest some ways to deal with this problem to avoid SDPs, because as we saw, SDPs are not so scalable. But also uh, in this problem, you can impose certain structure on A. You can impose that not all features can be multiplied with each other. So A is sparse, for example. So it has a potential. And uh, actually, these guys, they've done an implementation of this approach. So you can have a look at it if you're interested. That was my first example. And uh, the se second example will be a bit less straightforward, although still pretty uh, intuitive. So recall that uh, a Lipschitz constant of a function f on a set X with respect to a given norm is defined in the following way. So it's the minimum constant such that for any X and Y from X, the distance between F of X and uh, F of Y is not larger than L multiplied by the distance between X and Y. If L is finite, uh, F is called uh, Lipschitz continuous with uh, the Lipschitz constant L. And Lipschitz continuity is uh, a property which is stronger than general continuity. It also means that the function is kind of bounded in a way. 
And this property is frequently used in optimization to show some, for example, convergence and running times properties of optimization algorithms. However, I have also learned that uh, apparently Lipschitz constant uh, reflects the generaliz generalization property of neural networks. So uh, the smaller the Lipschitz constant is, the more generalizable the neural, neural network is. That is, uh, the better it works out of sample. So it, uh, the research shows that uh, it works regular, uh, people can regularize neural networks by bounding their Lipschitz constant. And therefore, it is actually to estimate how generalizable your neural network is, it is good to be able to estimate this Lipschitz constant. And uh, here we will consider a very simple neural network. So uh, we have inputs S, X in the neural network. They are weighted with some weights W. The neural network has D layers. Uh, and uh, so at, in every layer we have this uh, weighting function. And uh, we have some activation function, which is not necessarily specified for now. And uh, our goal is to find the Lipschitz constant of this neural network, which is the Lipschitz constant of FD. So the, uh, this function in the last layer. Here I consider two manuscripts. They basically suggest very similar approaches, but they deal with uh, different types of activation functions, sigma. And uh, there are ways to obtain lower bounds on the Lipschitz constant. However, it's always good to be able to obtain the whole interval, both upper and lower bound, to actually see uh, the quality of the lower bound and to be able to have more information. And uh, in both papers, the authors suggest uh, a polynomial optimization way to obtain this upper bound. Here, for simplification, uh, we assume that the output is one-dimensional. For example, we just need to know a yes-no answer to something. Or, and that the set X is convex. I think the last one is not a very restrictive assumption, and the previous one uh, can potentially be relaxed, just we will have a more complicated expression as a result. And under this assumption, our lower bound on the Lipschitz constant will have the following expression. This expression is quite um, ugly, but we can see that if we look at the optimization variables, a and b1 to bd minus 1, marked by red here, this expression is polynomial in these variables. And here, diag is the operator which just stacks the vector bi on uh, the diagonal and the rest of the entries in the matrix, it makes zero. So this is a matrix with bi on the diagonal. This whole expression is polynomial in A and B. And uh, G1 and GK are some known low degree polynomials. They depend on the activation. So they are different in these two manuscripts and on the chosen norm. Now, we already know how to deal with these problems. So basically, we can just replace uh, this non-negativity. We can use the lower bound approach. And uh, since here it is supremum instead of infimum, so here we maximized using exactly the same approach as before. Before we minimize and we got a lower bound. Now we maximize and we get an upper bound. So by using the same approach as before, we get an upper bound. And uh, the interesting thing here is that neural networks, they usually possess quite a lot of sparsity of how their layers are connected. And therefore, uh, I think this approach can be promising uh, in the future when more research is done in this direction. And by now, I think it's just an interesting uh, direction to look at. So these are my two applications. And now I think we can conclude. So. In this talk, I have a little bit opened the door in polynomial optimization for you, but there is still a lot to see there. And uh, if you 
find it interesting, uh, then you can have a look at this book. You'll see it later in, uh, in the list of uh, literature. And in this book, you can have see more details on sums of squares, and you can also see more details on other approaches, and in particular, uh, at how the polynomial optimization problems are related to generalized method of moments problems, and in general to measure theoretic problems, because there is a very deep and uh, interesting relationship between them. So if you are interested, please have a look at the book. Now, we have said that uh, polynomial op uh, optimization is, if we use sums of squares for it, then uh, it is strongly related to SDP programming and it has issues with scaling. However, as I said, more and more ways uh, has been occurring recently to deal with this lack of scalability of SDPs. In particular, we don't have to use SOS. We can use some other types of non-negative polynomials. They might provide us weaker bounds, not always actually, uh, but they will not require using sums of squares and SDPs, but using some other optimization approaches. Also, as I mentioned, we can exploit sparsity and symmetry of problems, uh, but have not given details. So if you are interested in these details, please have a look at this survey. It is quite recent and quite full. So I hope uh, that was a nice acquaintance for you with this type of problems. And uh, thanks a lot for your attention. And you're welcome with your questions. Now, before I say goodbye, I will show the first page of references and the second page of references. So again, thanks to everyone, uh, thanks to people who attend, thanks to the organizers, and bye-bye. Uh,